Hello everyone and welcome back. And today we're doing a little video at the request of a viewer. And forgive me, Michael, I'm going to tr try to pronounce your name, but uh, my German is atrocious. It's Michael, and I know I'm putting an American accent or in inclination or intonation, thank you, intonation on that. Bachhofer? Bachhofer? I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. I hope I'm not butchering it too badly, Michael. He sent me a nice little email and asking about melting steel coins using this induction heater, one of these Chinese induction heaters here. I had to give him the bad news that it is unlikely going to do the job. And I did not have the coins that he's using, but I do have a 16 millimeter by almost one millimeter thick washer, which is about the size of one of the coins. These, these are steel coins, by the way. We also have a knockout plug from an electrical panel. That's about 23 millimeters by about 1.5 millimeters. I have two pieces of aluminum 5052H32 alloy, and I know that specifically because I actually made these parts many years ago. That has a melting point of 649 degrees C. This unit will not get it hot enough to melt those. It will get hot enough to melt these U.S. pennies. Now, we're not actually melting the copper. What we're melting is the zinc inside. These are actually cast or, or stamped from zinc, and then they're flash-coated with copper. And zinc melts at 419 C, so we can get to 419 degrees centigrade with this unit for sure. And of course, if you watched my previous video, you saw me melt my solder. I have a great big slug of solder, and I'll strip the piece out of the other video. Here's what the piece of solder from uh, the last experiment looks like. That, of course, melts at 183 degrees centigrade. And this is essentially what I purchased this unit for, was to have a very quick heating solder pot so I could do my coaxial connections by tinning the braid of the coax. That video is coming. I have to get down to the ham radio shop, uh, shop next week and pick up some more PL259s. I don't have any more fresh new ones, and I want to do this on camera with some nice, shiny, clean, silver-plated PL259 so I don't make a mess of everything. It'd be bad to have an instruction video and not be able to come up with a, a decent solder joint. Today we're going to try to help Michael out here a little bit and show him what's going on. Now I have this scope meter set up to measure millivolts because I'm running a little bit higher power than I was uh, the last experiment. We have a current shunt, 100 millivolts for 25 amperes, so essentially that's a divide by 4. When I'm running that great big slug of solder through the unit, I draw a current of about 66, well, I get a voltage of 66.5 millivolts. That divided by 4 is 16.625 amperes. My power supply over here is running 48 volts. The unit, the, man, the manufacturer or the, the vendor who sells these inductive heaters says do not exceed... 60 or excuse me 53 volts so i figure i'm safe at 48 i i could boost that power supply up to 50 i'm not going to at any rate 16.625 amps at 48 volts means an input of 798 watts there of course is some loss of efficiency through the unit so i'm probably putting at least 700 watts of rf into the coil that is sufficient to heat the solder with ease it's sufficient to melt zinc pennies with ease however that will not achieve the temperatures of roughly 1371 centigrade to 1400 centigrade needed to melt steel part of the problem is is as the steel gets hotter its resistance increases it's probably also beginning to reach 
part of the curve and the Curie point. Now it's not going to reach the absolute Curie point until almost a thousand degrees centigrade. But its magnetic properties are going to degrade along with its electrical conductivity as the temperature goes up. And they get up to cherry red, so it's probably approaching 600 degrees centigrade. I'm guessing that from the color. I tried hooking a thermocouple on here, and I just couldn't come up with a good, successful way to hook my thermocouple to the unit. I wasn't getting good readings, so I'm just judging that from color. And the fact that I can't melt this aluminum, which is 650, I know I'm below 650 degrees. So my initial guess of 600 is probably pretty close, just based on color temperature. So let's uh, get this thing set up and turned on. Oh, you'll see an interesting effect. I'm going to try to get everything in the shot here. I'm going to hope the meter stays in the shot as well as the... This is what we call a sheetrock screw in the United States or a drywall screw. They're steel screws used for uh, building interior walls of homes. As its temperature goes up, as you see this start to get red, you will see the current begin to fall off as the electrical resistance rises and the magnetic density drops. So let me try to get that set up. Be right back. Okay, I tried setting the camera up with the lights out so that you could see the screw begin to glow red, but every time I did that, the meter backlight washes the camera out, and even on its lowest setting, which it's on now, it still overpowers the camera. There's just not enough dynamic range in the lens or in the camera. So I'm going to turn this on and we should see the nail get hot and we should see the current initially come fairly high and then drop off fairly quickly as the, as the screw gets hot. And when you hear the relay pull in and buzz, what you're hearing now is the power supply. That means we're starting the heating cycle. There it is. We're starting at 50 4 milliampers or millivolts now you see it dropping rapidly because the screw has gotten quite hot and in fact I think you can fairly clearly see it's good in red it's getting hot but it will never reach the melting point the, that 32 millivolts times 4 let's see what we have here and we'll call it 32 divided by 4 that's 8 amperes times 48 volts. That's only 380 watts. So that's not enough power being dumped into that screw to get it any hotter than it is right now. At this point, it's giving off heat as fast as we're adding energy. It's, it's expending the energy and heat as fast as we can heat it. So it simply isn't going to get any hotter. So we'll take that out. I'll shut off the heat. And uh, we'll put the so-called coins in and see what happens. Now we have our 23 millimeter by 1.5 millimeter coin in here. And let me tell you, this little crucible got pretty hot. I've put a ceramic standoff underneath the crucible so that the coin is roughly in the center of the coil vertically. And if you try this, make sure you stand the coin up vertically. If it's laying on the bottom of the crucible, the energy transfer between the copper heating coil or induction coil and the coin or the material you're trying to heat won't be very efficient. Stand the coin up and it will, it will heat up much quicker and transfer a lot more energy. So now I'm going to close the circuit breaker. And when you hear the relay pull in, that means the unit is energized. Here we are, we're at 51 or 52, you can see the smoke coming off as the zinc plating burns off that thing. And it's turning red. And that's it, the current has dropped from 54, we're down to, or not current, the voltage across the shunt has dropped from 54 millivolts to 29 millivolts. So 29 millivolts divided by four, would be seven amps roughly. Oop, it's climbing a little bit again, but the coin or the disc, metal disc, has reached as high a temperature as it's going to get to. It simply can't go any higher at this point. So I'm going to shut this off. 
and very quickly take this coin out and we'll drop now nah, I don't want to drop it on my solder we'll put it there let it cool off I will put a out son of a gun son of a gun my little aluminum pieces that are sitting on the table near the coil <laughs> just near the coil got hot and that's burning yeah throw it down here on the concrete floor all right there's a piece of aluminum we'll close the circuit breaker and it should stand up when the current comes on There it is. By the way, there's an interesting video on YouTube where the guy levitates a piece of aluminum. He has the last three turns of his coil inverted. It's on a very high energy unit. And he levitates a piece of aluminum until it becomes molten and then falls through the coil. But he's using a much, much higher power unit than these are. And as you can see, Right now we're sitting again at 28 millivolts. It just won't get any hotter. That aluminum just will not continue to increase in temperature. And believe me, it's hot. Aluminum doesn't glow like steel does. But if I take this out and drop it on the wood, I'm surprised it cooled off. Yep, no, it branded the wood. You can see the outline on the wood over here. So it's quite hot. But this gives off heat a lot faster than the steel does. Now we'll throw a US penny in here. And we'll see how long that takes. It's turning black. I have melted these before. I'm surprised this one's not. Or did I grab a real? No, it's beginning to melt. I think. Maybe that's a solid copper one. Let's try another one. If I grabbed an old one, they're made out of copper. And by the way, while I'm doing this, the inductors on this heater are getting quite warm as are the capacitors. I even have a fan blowing on them. Well, the last time I did this I had my other power supply cranked up to almost 60 volts. So I guess turning the voltage up a little bit does increase your chances, but it's certainly never going to get hot enough to melt steel. You know, we're not even melting zinc at this point. Oh yes we are. I just didn't leave it long enough. You can see the zinc leaking out of that now. Had I left it in there a little bit longer, it would have gone molten. That one must be pure copper. This one's obviously zinc. And just to prove that this thing does work for my intended purpose, this is my slug of solder. And you can see that's a good sized hunk of solder. And I'm going to carefully set that down into the crucible so that I don't break it. And we will, as we did in my other video, I'm going to move the camera up a little bit here. Move this over. I am going to put the stopwatch here. And when the relay pulls in, I am going to activate the stopwatch. We'll see how long it takes to turn that slug molten. 
and you'll hear the relay pull in here in a second. Okay, there we go. That's Ten seconds. Okay, I'm starting to see the edges melt at 16 seconds. And it's probably fairly obvious. Now the controller's kicking out because the bottom of this, where the thermocouple is, is already up to temperature. It's just up here at the top where it's in free air. It hasn't quite reached the molten point yet. But this will equalize. And at 42 seconds, we're almost completely there. And of course, it's going to make a liar out of me today. I'm going to turbocharge it just a little bit force it into the molten state and there you have it that will hold my solder Ooh, my watch is getting warm it's a steel band in under a minute we're just about ready to go and when it's on when it's energized we're pulling about I'm gonna manually do it about 67 millivolts, 68 millivolts, and that puts us right in the 16, 17 amp curve. So for steel, Michael, I'm afraid not, but I do appreciate the email. Getting little challenges from the viewers like that make this whole thing absolutely worthwhile. It can take a while to set up these experiments. You run around, gather parts, you try to get everything in a cohesive uh, manner here But without you guys sending feedback back and and asking questions It just kind of gets boring when I get an email like I did from Michael. I got excited I said let's try that little experiment. Let's put it on camera for him This is the radio mechanic Hope you liked it. See you again. Bye now